couple of days ago I came back home from my trip to Italy first and then to Origins Game Fair 2015 and when I came home among the mail there was an envelope, a large envelope from Finland and I was like what is this? and in the envelope there was a game that I knew absolutely nothing about so I assumed that the publisher sent it to me as a review copy maybe an admirer sent it to me as a present, I don't know either way the envelope contained a game that I was curious about because I had never heard or seen anything about it the game is called W1815 and W has nothing to do with George Bush uh, but with Waterloo, I assume at least Waterloo is the topic of the game it's, game came, it's a game that comes in a Ziploc bag and as I started looking at it I thought something is strange here first I thought that the instructions were missing because I couldn't find them then I realized that actually the instructions are printed on the inside of the cardboard folder which is placed inside the Ziploc bag to uh, to keep the thing sturdy and to form the cover and the back cover so it's basically on a single sheet of cardboard it's two pages of rules for a game about Waterloo then I looked at the length and it says 15 minutes and I thought ah oh, this roll typo must be 150 no uh, they really meant it 15 minutes now a Waterloo game uh, the last 15 minutes, two pages of rules, so how can this be any good? It's probably gonna be some sort of like super abstract checkers game with just uh, red and and blue pieces. How can there be a Waterloo theme in this package? Literally I know there is. This is a game that does manage to give you a good sense of Battle of Waterloo. Incredibly, incredibly enough. Let me show you how the game achieves this. This is the board of the game. It is printed on cardboard and as you can see the game really does not take up too much space here. I've set it up on my desk in front of my computer or computer screen. I have enough room between the board and the cards that needed to be used to play it on my desk. Also the game works very well in a solitaire form thanks to the high amount of die rolls that you have. So easy to set up, you can set up anywhere. Now, here you have the board with the indication of where you set up the initial units. The units do not move, you have blue um, blue um, wooden pieces for the French, red and black for the Allies, so of course we have the British and the Prussians there. But the pieces do not move, simply what happens is you declare the action that the various cores of the armies are taking, you resolve the action and then if you took casualties you remove the corresponding wooden pieces representing the units that suffer casualties and you move them on this track here which is the casualty track. There's a casualty track from the French, for the French and one for the Allies, they also do morale tracks. Of course, the more quote unquote morale hits you take, the lower the uh, value becomes. So during gameplay, players will simply remove pieces from the battlefields to the casualty tracks. They will also lower the morale. As you can see, some boxes on the casualty track have an RT indication that indicates um, route tests. When a casualty adds a piece to a casualty box with an RT indication, the army that took that casualty has to take a route test and sometimes modifiers may be applied. For example, the French have modifiers here on the casualty track itself and also depending on the time of the day the armies will start getting tired and there will be other route test modifiers that will apply. Even though they are printed here in red, these route uh, test modifiers, uh, depending on the time of the day, apply to both players, not just to the ally player, as it may appear from the red color that is used here. When you have to take a route test because of a casualty, you roll a d6, you apply possible modifiers, and if you roll higher than the current level of morale of your army, then your army routes and you have lost the battle. This is the uh, victory condition route the opponent, and do not route yourself. Now, uh, 
as you can see the forces of the armies are divided in cores each with a specific indication and each core has a card that pretty much tells you what that part of the army can do for example here we have for the for the allies we have the group named after hell and it tells you here what the target of the group can be. Uh, groups usually can target one or two opposite groups. They can't go around and attack things in a crazy and unrealistic fashion. For example, here Hill will attack Rey, uh, which is the second core. It's super simple. When you the, when it's your turn, you choose one of your gr groups to activate. You choose the target in case there is a choice. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes the group that you activate is forced to attack a specific enemy. You roll a die. You apply possible modifiers. Some actions have modifiers, and you read the result. Super simple. FM means French morale loss. AM Allied morale loss. Uh, AC, LA casualty, FC, French casualty. So if you activate Hill to attack, he will attack the uh, French second corps. And if you roll a six, it will inflict two French casualties and also will suffer one LA casualty, which you record again by transferring uh, pieces from this side of the board to this area here to the tracks. Now, as you can see, um, some units uh, have counterattacks. This is a special type of attack which you can take if you are targeting the corresponding enemy by activating the correct uh, unit after the target unit just acted. So if the French used uh, their lawn, then I could choose right away, right after that, when it is my turn, to use Axe Bridge to counterattack the lawn. So the counterattacks are not always available. They're available only as a response to the group that you're counterattacking. Some other special groups, uh, the allies also had the reserve. Very important, the reserves have several possible actions. When you activate the reserve, you choose the action and you simply implement the um, the text under the action. What pretty much the reserves allow you to do is to ignore casualties or ignore the capture of specific places at the expense of casualties coming from the reserve. It's an extra way of simulating the fact that you are using your casualties to fill in gaps and to counteract enemy actions. Wellington, you can activate it to declare a general advance with the effects printed here. Napoleon, you can activate it to get better chances of success. You choose a French action to play, you roll two dice, and then you choose the one that you want to, to resolve. It seems pretty simple, and it is, but there are a lot of subtleties that come from the way that the units can interact. For example, units can be attacked by a cavalry, by a cavalry charge, and as a result, then they get in a square formation, and if they're attacked successively um, by cavalry charges, now they're in square, and they are much harder to, uh, to hit. For example, this is what happens to... Hill, game effects may move hill into the squares formation. Another very important actor in this drama is Blucher with the Prussians. Uh, the LA player can activate Blucher. When you activate Blucher, you roll a die and you simply see what happens. A very common action that Blucher will perform will be to add the Prussian division. Uh, and if, as an effect, a Prussian division arrives to the battlefield. When that effect is in place, you simply add a Prussian piece to the battlefield here on the flank that uh, Blucher is attacking. And uh, each Prussian division that joins the fight will give a modifier to future die rolls. The more Prussians are there, the easier it is for the following ones that are joining the battle to do some damage. As you can see, there can be an effect which can be here reached only thanks to modifiers in which you inflict a French casualty and also you capture a location, in which case you simply replace the cube to indicate control. 
Another interesting group is the Grand Battery, um, which is super powerful. Okay, it's a great defense if the British decide to attack it frontally, but it can also be tricky. They usually target the first core of the opponent. But if you roll a 1, then some of your artillery pieces get stuck in mud and you have to, remo to remove a grand, a grand battery marker. There can be no effect or there can be some pretty tough um, damage inflicted on the opponent. The guard, the French guard is super powerful, but the more you use it, the lower the French morale goes. So you can see you can inflict damage, but you also take damage and your morale goes down. So as you can see, there's a lot that has been hardwired in the system, a lot of effects that uh, are connected to one another, a lot of possible ways of responding to the opponent's actions. The overall story, however, remains the one that we know from history. The French are trying to break the um, the British defense as the uh, the Allies are trying to hold the position to fill in the gaps using the reserves as they are waiting for the Prussians to arrive. So as the uh, ally player, you're trying to buy your time to find the right. Uh, balance between defending your position and allowing the Prussians to arrive to finally deliver the final blow against the French. As a French player, you're also working on a tightrope, you also have several objectives to achieve. The best one, the ideal one for you would be to simply break the uh, enemy will to fight before the Prussians arrive. That's going to be pretty tough. So again, your balancing act is going to be between inflicting damage and trying to push back the Prussians, which you can do by using some of your forces. And again, you need to be able to select well. For example, if you activate this group, then as a response, you can remove Prussian divisions if you manage to roll well enough, but you're also taking casualties. So a lot of things may happen, but the basic idea is so super simple. When it is your turn, you choose one of your forces to activate. You choose an action. If there is a choice, you will die to determine the result, and that's it. But the complexity, the flavor, the theme of the game all comes um, from understanding the possible interactions and how certain attacks can result in counterattacks, which may result in counteractions, which may result in various effects. Through all of these elements which are hardwired in the system, the story does emerge, the battle takes shape and a lot of possible outcomes are possible but they do happen miraculously, almost magically along historical lines. So my first impression was that this wasn't exactly a game, it was a choose your own adventure type of book uh, with cards instead of a book. Uh, in a sense it is, because some uh, decisions that you make will make certain other reactions more likely. Um, but there is this interconnection of these working pieces of the machine, which is not exactly the same, however, as you have in the Choose Adventure box. But certain things will more likely determine certain other actions than you choose, maybe among one or two possible cores. Uh, that would make sense to activate, uh, then you go to the card, you roll the die, and you respond to that. Uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure book come, came to my probably because of the interconnectedness. It's not like a next encounter word game in which you have a space in which you're just working around and moving from adjacent area to adjacent area. Uh, you more have the sense of a narrative interconnection. If I attack with a certain core and I'm lucky, I'm gonna take a certain position. Then I can choose to try to take it back, to attack in another location, etc, etc. Which of course technically you also have in an X encounter game, but here movement is abstracted. You do not actually move the pieces on the board. So it really takes 
The movement and the action takes place in your mind, similarly to what happens in a narrative, in a book. Um, I don't move my, my French pieces to take control of a certain hill, I simply know that I did it and I place a control marker there, so I imagine that I'm seeing my, 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 my forces move into that area, even though they actually don't. They simply are on the board in the initial position or on the casualty track. But what is really interesting is that in this intricate system of interconnections, there's so much history, there's so much theme uh, that have been wired, hardwired into the system. You do not have to remember a lot of rules, you do not have to remember how a certain core works. There isn't an exception for this or that, there are some small exceptions. But everything is uh, has reminders on the cards, uh, there are all these little tables of possible outcomes on the cards. There's a huge amount of information on the cards, which means that you do not have to worry about them. You learn the rules, which are super simple, and you start playing. Truth to be told, that also means that before you fully see all the interconnections, um, you need to play a little bit. You may have the sense at the beginning that the things are not very well connected. I attack with what group and then I fire some guns and then I attack with the cavalry. My opponent attacks with that other thing. But if you're familiar with the history and you start seeing how certain connections are meant to mirror history, then you start seeing what this is really about and how uh, the game does manage to build a narrative along historical lines. Then you see the problem problem of holding back the French while the Prussians are coming, or the importance of, of trying to wear out the Grand Battery of the French, possibly without exploding, exposing too many of your allies to certain destruction, uh, the, the back and forth between infantry that tries to form squares and the cavalry that tries to to, to inflict some damage before the squares become effective. You really see that it starts like just a, a, two sets of cards that you can pick any, any one of, but then you start seeing how those cards mirror history and what are in fact the ways of connecting cards. Which doesn't mean there is a single algorithm that the EU will solve, that at least is not my impression, but simply there are certain highways, certain decisions, certain interconnections of decisions that make more sense and it may be more profitable for you to consider from time to time rather than erratically activate things all over the board. Which, however, if you want, you can. So there's also the, the, the interesting decision there. You had to choose between concentrating on specific areas of the board and maybe try to push an attack several times or try to spread out your, your decisions, uh, spread out your actions probably either action, take, either course of action taken to um, the extreme would be non-profitable, but finding the balance is part of the challenge. So there is, uh, there is a lot that has been factored in, in a certain sense this is almost like a bonsai game, it's a it's very small and compact game compared to the monstrosity, the monstrous, monstrous complexity of the event that you have representing other games that take longer than the actual battle to play. Um, here you have something that in 15 minutes, boom, it's done, but really does capture the feel, the flow of the battle, does capture a lot of the historical elements and what's most important to me, the historical dynamics, precisely again, the connection, how the elements can influence each other and can uh, result in serious, in complex uh, chains of events. There is a large amount of luck here, but with a game this short, so you can see what would have happened if a certain core was particularly unlucky, if they did everything right and simply uh, nothing went right. Remember, in a war everything is very simple, but the simplest thing is very difficult. This game is a little game for sure, it's a small game, but I, trust me, this is a small gem. It felt very innovative, very fresh, different from a lot of other games or most of the games that I played. If anything, the only other game that comes to mind that 
as a similar philosophy would be Quartermaster General, uh, where you also have such an incredible condensation of historical factors into the most essential, the most basic, the most barebone, and yet still thematically rewarding depiction of historical events. Um, that game manages to to capture all of World War II in a single evening or less than an evening. Here you have a battle of great complexity, great historical importance that is playable in 15 minutes. You can play it with non-war gamers, you can play with anybody who has any interest in, hist interest in history and I think that they would appreciate and enjoy the amazingly uh, fascinating and vivid portrayal of history that you can have through this game, through such a small picture and yet again there is so much accuracy, there is so much richness, so much detail, and let's not forget, so much fun. It's a good game, it's a really good game, fresh, innovative, and just a lot of fun.